Good morning and thank you for joining us. My name is Ramati Banga. I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel session this morning, jointly put together by Florets, the largest UK property consultancy dedicated to license and leisure property and who celebrated their 200 year anniversary last summer, and Phil Fisher. We're a full service law firm with a considerable hotel and leisure sector practice. We have a fantastic panel for you this morning, whom I would like to introduce now. Chris Gambrell, CEO of Brewhouse and Kitchen. Chris has been described as a publican, brewer, investor, and disappointed Welshman. His words, something to do with rugby, I understand. Roger Payne, CEO and founder of Enhanced Hospitality Limited. Roger is a well-known London-based entrepreneur with a career spanning decades. The Enhanced Hospitality platform operates a range of venues from fine dining to city wine bar and restaurants, bars, clubs, and large-scale events and entertainment establishments. Roger is also a Freeman of the City of London. Adam Howitt, MD of Howitt Hospitality Consultants, trusted partners to businesses operating within the hospitality and leisure industries. Adam is also the CEO of Aspirational Brands, overseeing the operation of over 35 bars and restaurants, including the brands Lemongrass, Handmade Burger, Pizza Social, and Cheshire House. Anthony Phillips, Head of Real Estate and Head of Property Litigation at Field Fisher and Richard Thomas, Divisional Director at Florets. Now, before we turn to the panel, I just want to run through a couple of housekeeping points. If you have any questions, please use the questions box in your, in your control panel. Um, it should be on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll aim to get through as many questions as possible at the end of the session. But if we don't get time to answer all the questions, our team will follow up with you individually after we've finished. Should you have any technical issues, please do also use the questions drop down and one of our technical team will be in touch to try to assist. Finally, we will be using audience polling during today's session, but I'll explain how it'll work when we get to that point. Where we've received questions from you, the audience, already when you were registering, we've tried to weave those themes into the questions for our panel. So now turning to the panel for the first question, we have a roadmap for emerging from lockdown, vaccinations and motoring, but there are still warnings about future outbreaks. So what does the landscape look like for operators in the short, medium, long term? Um, Chris, do you want to kick us off on this one? Yeah, I think, um, well, the landscape really um, is, I think in the short term, very positive. In the medium term, I think we need to be more cautious the key thing for us is that the um, the consumer is evolving and changing, and we're seeing that through some research we're currently doing. And what we had probably 14 months ago is not what we're going to be dealing with probably from the 12th and April onwards. And certainly, again, even from the, the, the post-initial lockdown period, I think the consumer has evolved again. But yes, yeah, certainly, I think it's by our nature as hospitality operators that we are optimistic and positive. Uh, so we're certainly optimistic in the short term uh, that what the Thank third you. wave will bring will depend. I think you need to be uh, optimistic uh, over the last 12 months. Um, Roger, um, do you have anything to, to add? Well, I, I, uh, I think I share Chris's views. Um, there's going to be a big bounce back to hospitality, there's a pent up demand. Um, but how we're able to service that if the lockdowns are extended in any way or things change, I think the government are in a bit of a difficult position at the moment. I think that everybody's so expecting relaxation that I think they'll find it. Uh, very difficult to change the uh, timetable. And you don't have to look at the slight increase in uh, public disorder that we're getting, uh, Bristol recently and other places. I think this will affect government's decision making in our favour. Um, but I'm completely with Chris. I think short term, particularly suburbs and major out, uh, major towns uh, that are, you know, sort of commuter towns would do well. Um, I think the city centres and financial districts will be tougher. Do you think the government might um, sort of speed up um, or you think they'll stick then to the 12th of April? So our analysis, or? yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Our analysis is that the government will stick to its timetable because I think they don't want to speed it up and they have a, they feel, I believe, a greater chance of it working if they don't speed it up. But I don't think they can go much longer because I think people will, uh, I think there'll be too much disruption to society just won't stand for it now, I'm afraid. Right or wrong? Thank you. Um, Adam? 
No, I think I re reiterate both Rogers and Chris's points there. Um, short term, I think it's probably um, the focus for a lot of businesses is going to be more around survival, kind of business viability. Um, obviously, looking forward to the reopenings. Um, obviously, there's lots of factors in there, um, landscape wise, bringing staff back from furlough, making sure your teams are engaged. There's lots of things that we're going to we're going to start to face in those sort of areas. Uh, we've had our whole workforce out out kind of at home for pretty much the last 12 months and getting them back into the habit uh, and the service points the steps of service we're, we're going to see we're going to face quite a, quite a few challenges in the short term looking kind of more to the medium we're probably looking for my side of things it's about building resilience putting a bit of wool on our back and generating a bit of cash we're going to have a lot of business out there in a, a, a negative coming out of a negative cash flow position We've got high debt positions, whether that be through bounce back loans, the Sybils, things like that. There's things that we're not going to be used to having to deal with on top of everything else. And then I think it's going to be about adapting, reacting and pivoting our businesses. I think the uh, guys made a good point around obviously the suburbs are going to be thriving. City centres, we're not going to be seeing as many commuters coming in, especially uh, kind of short to medium term. We're going to be looking at less tourism theatres, shows aren't going to be on and we need to be looking to change our business models and identify the fact that consumer trends have changed significantly and we're now we are going to be looking at trying to change consumer habits which have been forming over the last 12 months. No, absolutely. I mean, and on that, I mean, we're seeing across Europe, and I appreciate that they are behind us um, you know, in terms of the vaccination programmes, but um, there are third waves um, you know, in various countries around Europe, and, and um, you know, it's been said that um, we may have a, a bumpy road coming up. Um, you know, maybe um, a further lockdown in the summer. Um, what? Clearly, you're going to be spending a lot of money um, to gear up. Are people getting ready to open? Are people holding back um, and thinking, let's let's wait and see, or let's wait till the summer? Um, how can you guard? against um, future closures? How can you deal with this? Well, I think similar to what we did, um, whether we, people agree or disagree with the Eat Out to Help Out scheme previously, I think that it allowed a lot of operators to generate some cash, put some cash in the bank and be able to weather the storm of further lockdowns. Uh, I think re this reopening process, it's about us getting um, ourselves in a good position cash-wise, generating a bit more cash flow to be able to potentially weather any future storms. I think we're, whether we look at what's happened in over in America um, or thing and support, oh. we mm -hmm. America, for example, a lot of the grants have been a lot of the loans have been converted into grants. So therefore, we go we've gone we've gone from a debt debt funding to cash funding. Um, Europe, we've seen people go uh, and percentages of support around loss of revenue or loss of, of the ongoing fixed rates so i think there's there's lots more we can potentially look at around support but ultimately it, we're going to have to look to ourselves initially to generate that cash flow to be able to um, weather another storm thank you um and chris roger i don't know if you wants to come back in at all just in terms of that particular out um that particular aspect um and also just looking longer term um there's you know people can be saddled with a lot of debt yeah, I think um, in terms of obviously the debt is is uh, not totally underwritten. I think there's a misconception out there that it is completely underwritten. It isn't, and obviously it's it's just a can that's been kicked heavily down the road. I mean, a lot of those repayment plans are kicking in now, so I agree with Adam. It's just a you know there's going to need to be more government intervention around debt. In terms of the consumer, I think the the big thing to, re to re I suppose that the big piece for us is that our research is telling us that consumers still want COVID safe environments. And I think believing that, you know, we're going to come out of this on the 17th of May, we can trade indoors and then we can that we can completely unrestrict on the 21st of June. Well, that's fine for us. But I actually think there's a huge body of consumers out there who will walk into our businesses wearing masks, would expect the screens and the uh, social distancing measures still to be in place. They want to see the sanitizer stations and they want a table service. 56% of all our guests want the table service to continue as a pub operation, to give you a, a, you know, a view of it. So consumers are not ready to relax as much as uh, we possibly are. So we're gonna to have to go with the flow a little bit on that one. 
No, absolutely. I mean, and on that point, I mean, obviously that that'll affect um, you know capacity, but um, the the difference in table service to um, you know sort of vertical drinking does it the effect of that on revenue generation? I think well, it depends on your food focus. We saw an eight percent jump in food mix uh last year which is great news for us we're up to sort of 50 percent food and liquor and we're a brew pub business so so for us it was um it was good in that respect you drove up the spend by head by nine pounds per person so you know that's been good for us but if you are uh heavily invested in liquor uh it's going to be a problem i think and there's yeah. all sorts of health issues as well people the consumer has evolved and changed i mean there are health issues at play here we've got an aged population that will be a little bit much more cautious in coming out um, you know, you can see it by the reaction to the Boris's statement this week about vaccine tests, which I don't know, you'll probably talk about later, but the vast majority of people over 50 support it, whatever we think, or how enforceable it actually is, and that tells you where the consumer is. Again, they are nervous, they're cautious, they, 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 they are thinking and acting in our best interest, but they're, they're nervous, and so we don't have this great big sort of hedonistic unlock on the 21st of June. I think that's a, that, that could be a huge uh, mis, misreading of the situation going forward. No, thank you. I mean, and Roger, I know that um, obviously you operate quite a, a broad range of um, uh, venues um, and types of venue. Um, are you adopting a sort of a different approach in, in each in terms of whether you'll be open in, you know, opening up in, in April or um, some of the, the larger venues perhaps um, delaying? Yeah, this is a couple of points, I think, uh, from what Chris has said. I think Chris is correct uh, with, the, with the people still requiring and expecting the uh, safety measures. But in terms of the sort of spectrum, I think it all depends on what the profile of your customer is. The younger age group, as was shown, you know, the London Fields, for example, pubs there serving and the other 10,000 people camping out in the middle of lockdown in June, drinking all afternoon on Sundays that to get broken up. I think um, depending on what pop part of the population you deal with is the bit, the, the third that doesn't care, the third that sort of wants safety and the third that won't go out anyway kind of thing we read about. And I think um, it depends. So in, for, for our business, we are approaching um, the open, reopening up in, in different ways, depending on what we're dealing with. So um, where we might be doing large scale brunch events, but with tables of six, they obviously carefully run, but where our restaurant business is, exactly as Chris is describing, uh, our pub business is the same, the table of service. But our city, uh, we've got, we got quite a large estate in financial district of London, and uh, we're not even thinking of opening until the 15th of September. That's the earliest we'll open that up. Gosh. Yep, and, and then presumably that's linked to um, the idea that people be working from home and, and really not coming back in properly. Well, I've been pulling everybody I know in Ernst and Young. I've asked you the same question. I've asked my <laughs> nieces, uh, Alan and Overy, anybody I know in any institution, and everybody seems to be take your holidays July and August. Come back to the office three days a week this year is the kind of um mm -hmm. thing i'm hearing i'm hearing that some people are being asked to work a friday or a monday as part of their three-day week they can't have the long weekends i'm hearing some of those some firms are adopting that strategy um but it seems to me that there's not going to be the density of population people to eat to come out and 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 and, and, and eat and drink or whatever they're going to do um and i think it's no point in us reopening so we're keeping uh, 11 venues shut until september that's an interesting point, and um, I mean, I certainly know, obviously, sort of from going into the financial district, um, it is it is very quiet, um, you know, even at the points at which we came out of um, lockdown last year. Um, thank you. Um, j just before we move to the next question, um, we would like the audience to um, participate. Um, now you'll be able to view the polls in your viewer pa viewer pane. Hopefully, you can see see that now. Um, once the poll is launched, please <clears throat> select your answer um, and click submit. Um, if you've got any questions, um, then our technical team will be on hand um, to assist. So the question for the audience is, should the government impose guidelines for how landlords and tenants should share the pain of unpaid rent? Um, so basically, do you think they should or should they leave it to commercial negotiation? Um, ultimately, Obviously, once forfeiture is again allowed, with that threat um, kind of hanging over, hanging over tenants. Um, so, what do you think? Should the government impose guidelines for how landlords and tenants should share the pain of unpaid rent? Please vote now, and we will let you have the results a little later on. Okay, so um, moving on to the next question for the panel. 
We have a difficult situation coming up, which obviously we've alluded to, um, with operators investing a lot to gear up for reopening. But at the same time, with the moratorium on forfeiture um, coming to an end shortly, what challenges do you see for tenants and landlords um, from a legal perspective? Um, and, and on that one, um, perhaps, Anthony, you can just touch a little bit on um, some of the, the sort of the rights and remedies available to um, landlords and obviously, therefore, the risk to, to tenants. Um, so, Anthony, did you want to let us have yeah, your views thanks on that? Marty. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's been a week of anniversaries, the anniversary of the of the first lockdown. And uh, today, <clears throat> in fact, um, coincidentally, is the um, first anniversary of the forfeiture moratorium coming into place, 26th of March 2020. Um, and essentially, as you know, that means that uh, landlords can't forfeit for non-payment of rent. That's even rent that fell due prior to the uh, to the COVID period. Um, that was that was a moratorium in place in 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 June, then September, then December last year. Uh, then the final moratorium extension till March, and then a final final um, moratorium extension to the uh, to the end of June. I think what a lot of people, I'll talk in a little bit, if I may, Ramato, about um, some of the measures that the, the government is looking at in order to try and um, deal with, with the 1st of July, if, if, if that right. indeed yes. is, is, is when, when things are lifted. But I, I would also remind, um, remind tenants and landlords, for that matter, mm -hmm. that um, where there's a forfeiture, there's a right for the tenant to apply for relief against forfeiture and i think what we're going to see whether the yeah and the court has discretion as to whether it, it grants relief against forfeiture and gives the uh, lease back to the tenant and if so on what terms so i think what we're going to see it, assuming the uh, this is the final final um extension of the moratorium i think we're going to see an awful lot of law in terms of what considerations the court give to whether or not they're going to grant relief and i think we're going to we're going to see uh, arguments about whether landlords have applied uh, complied with the code of practice whether tenants uh, have paid when they can um, what proposals have been made by landlords and tenants during the uh, during the lockdown period and also i think it's going to be argued uh, by hospitality sector and other sectors um, as to the fact that they're in a, a different um, a, a different environment than, um, than than essential shops and that sort of thing. So I think these are all factors that, are, that the court is going to opine on over the summer um, and we're going to get some guidance. And I think that will probably um, mean that landlords stop and think about forfeiture. They've also got to stop and think about forfeiture anyway. Um, because they've got to decide whether they're really going to get another tenant into the property um, if they forfeit their current leases. The other thing that comes to an end is in, in the end of June is the ability um, for landlords or any, indeed anyone else to serve statutory demands um, for unpaid rent or, or other sums. Um, and also, as, you know, as you'll be aware, there's, uh, there are no winding ups for unpaid rent that has fallen due during the pandemic period. That comes to an end at the end of June. And if you're a director of a company at the moment, there's a suspension um, of, in, in relation to wrongful trading. Um, that comes to an end at the end of June. So 1st of July is going to be a pretty extraordinary day. Landlords can forfeit leases, they can serve statutory demands, they can present winding up petitions, and directors are once again um, potentially vulnerable to wrongful trading claims. Uh, and that's all in an environment where we've got somewhere between 3 billion and 4.5 billion uh, worth of rent um, uh, due within, within the sector. So all this has led to the government, I think, having a bit of a panic. Um, they, there's a call for evidence at the moment, and I would encourage you, particularly in the in industry groups, if you're not doing so already, to uh, to make representations to the government. Um, the minister said that they will, the government will take steps 
if the, the voluntary codes of practices are not enough um, and I and will legislate if necessary. So what's that legisl legislation going to look like? Possibly time to pay for tenants, um, possibly a, a phased withdrawal um, for certain parts of the sector, uh, for certain sectors. I think hospitality has got to be a prime sector in relation to that. So in other words, the perhaps potentially the moratorium lifting later in certain sectors than others. And interesting, and there's been quite a lot of chat in the um, in, in the hospitality press about this, fire courts. Fire courts were introduced in 1666 after the Great Fire of London, um, whereby um, to try and help businesses that lost their uh, their premises due to, due to the Great Fire of London, possibly something like that. What I don't think we'll see is the court um, imposing rent holidays. I do not think they're going to um, allow tenants not to pay rent for a period of time. Uh, they've been robust about that throughout the lockdown period. Uh, and I think that will remain. So I think what I'd say is um, make your representations um, because the government has um, expressed a wish to protect vulnerable businesses and particularly a wish to protect jobs. So what I would say is when you're making your representation, particularly focus on jobs, um, but also focus on, on, on the, the, the you know, particular circumstances of, of the hospitality sector. Thank you. Um, one of the points I think is really interesting, and I, I, um, I, I hadn't heard about the fire courts, and it's an interesting, uh, interesting point. Um, we, we're aware that I think the courts are, I mean, certainly in my view, I think doing rather better than I thought that they, they would. Um, and have adapted to the current situation um, and you know, virtual hearings um, are going on. But um, it strikes me that, that you could have a really odd situation where um, a landlord tries to forfeit a lease, um, but the tenant is entitled to apply for relief. There, there must be huge delays. So how does that, how does that work? Because there's then going to be a large period of, of uncertainty. Um, it doesn't seem to be very, well, I, I can't think how it's going to work in practice. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, there are two situations. Obviously, you can forfeit a, a commercial premises by peaceful reentry or, or by court proceedings. Now, I think it's going to probably take a brave landlord to, uh, to, to, to forfeit by peaceful reentry, but it's, it's there as an option um, after the, um, after the, uh, the, the, the moratorium has lifted. In those circumstances, um, as a tenant, if you want to get back in, you'll be making an emergency application to, to, to get back into your premises um, uh, on the basis of a, of, of a relief application. I think the courts will hear those sorts of applications quite quickly. The other situation is where you're, um, you're, you're uh, through going through court proceedings. Um, it just means that, that a court proceedings brought by a landlord for forfeiture of the lease, where you counterclaim for relief against forfeiture, is going to be heard a long, long time in the future. And during that time, you, you have got time as a tenant to try and uh, resolve the situation, um, both in terms of, of getting rent paid, but also uh, trying to come to some sort of solution with the landlord. Because the landlord's going to have the uncertainty that you might get relief. Um, yes. So, so that I, I, it's, we're going to see the courts absolutely inundated, um, and they are going to struggle to cope. So, yeah, I think it's it's going to be an interesting, interesting picture. No, absolutely. Oh. And with this uncertainty, obviously, um, you know, with operators basically investing um, a fair amount um, of time and money. Um, which they don't necessarily have in actually trying to get premises reopened, but with this uncertainty hanging over, um, I mean, it occurs to me that it is likely that the government will do something, um, presumably just to um, extend or allow some sort of um, lead-in period for negotiation. Yeah, well, what, what, I, what I'd say is that, um, yeah, I think they will. Um, and what I would say is that is is that make sure I would say this is a litigator, but make sure your file is full of re if you're a tenant reasonable proposals um, in relation to the rent. Uh, you're going to stand a better chance, for example, getting getting relief and forfeiture 
Um, a, if you've demonstrated that you spent a lot of money on the pro property, I think that will be a factor that the court will take into account. But also, if you can demonstrate that you've acted reasonably throughout uh, both the pandemic period and, and indeed after it, um, then oh, the lockdown period, should I say, and, and then after it, then I think you will, um, you will stand a better chance of getting relief from forfeiture. So do, do bear that in mind. You'll also, but before that, if a landlord can see and will be advised by the, his, his or her lawyers that, that actually um, the tenant will get relief uh, or probably get relief, um, then that will inhibit them from, from actually forfeiting in the first place, I suspect. Yeah, no, interesting. I'm um, just wondering from the panel, um, Roger, I think you had a, a, a question or a comment. Yes, do you think, I, mean, you, I was going to ask you about what you felt, um, because I thought people might be interested in what pe on what you thought courts may take into account. Do you think courts will take into account mar new market conditions? So, for example, if deals have been done locally that are, that are say, more favourable to tenants, do you think courts might take into account the, uh, the, mar the marketplace as well in determining an offer picture? Um, I suspect not, Roger. Um, in terms, of, if, you, if you mean in in terms of lower rents um, and that 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 a tenant is 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 stuck in a deal that is not uh, market norm, I suspect it won't. Um, I think it's. I think the court's going to take the view that the tenant has done the deal that it's done um, in the in in the market. It's done it, um, and I think it's much more going to look at uh, proposals. Um, in relation to um, when the rent's going to be paid, over what period, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, I think now would be a good point just to um, see if the results are in from our um, from our first poll. Um, so just a quick reminder of the uh, the, the question: um, Should the government impose guidelines for how landlords and tenants should share the pain of unpaid rent? And uh, ah, interesting. Um, so 63% of our audience um, think yes and 37% um, think no. Um, just a little bit of context there. Um, our audience um, today is, um, is actually a broad mix. Um, I would say um, there is probably a larger percentage, percentage as it's probably evidenced by the poll here, um, of operators. Um, there are also landlords, um, there are banks um, and professional consultants. Um, and we have um, over over 100 attendees um, today. I don't know if the panel um, are surprised at this this result um, or, or wanted to comment at all. Um, Chris, is this a, a surprise to you? Um. Not, well, as you say, it's down to the profile. Uh, if it was all operators, then it would strongly suggest that a third of your operators have had pretty good deals and don't want the government to interfere any further. <laughs> so I think, you know, but obviously there is quite a mixed bag out there. I mean, certainly uh, from, from we, we, we've only got six leases, but and we've been pretty happy with the deals that we've actually done with our landlords. And, I, and, and on both sides, it's generally felt to be fair and equitable. I think Anthony's key point really at the very beginning was yes there's obviously a lot of machination that's going to happen legally between the landlord the tenant and the government in terms of what needs to be put in place but ultimately it's down to whether the landlord has a plan b and that's the way I look at it as being a, a commercial landlord in the past you can you can throw your weight around as much as you want and you probably get there in the end if you've got unpaid rent but the reality is if you've got a relatively competent operator who has got a who is on point in terms of the market and has got a, a plan surely you're better off knuckling down and working with that particular tenant as throwing yourself back in the market because the lease deals that I'm seeing coming up where there is vacancy right now are incredibly cheap and don't uh, bear no resemblance to the previous head rates. So, you know, you would, you, as an operator, you think, well, he would say this, wouldn't he anyway? But I mean, my, my encouragement <laughs> landlords would be, unless you've got a very, very good plan B, is, is, is to knuckle down and work. And we've, we've I said, like, no criticism to any of our six landlords at all. They've been They've been great, actually, and they've been fair and reasonable, and we've been the same. And I think also Anthony's point as well is brilliant about making sure you've made plenty of proposals, made lots of positive overtones and lots of proactive uh, 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 offers to your um, to the landlords to make sure that you know you get the you know that you'll you present well down the road. So. No, thank you, um, Richard. I don't know if you wanted to um, have any comments. Obviously, you're acting for a lot of clients. Yeah, so we, we're active for a number of landlords and tenants. 
in these negotiations and where we have been at a sort of a, a sort of an impasse for the last sort of six months and trying to get to deals there seems to be um, a flurry of deals being done and i think that's mainly because landlords are quite keen to get money in at the moment and as anthony said they're receiving advice and saying that there could be some relief going forward um from sort of government guidelines so i think they've just taken the view right let's get some cash in um and with the view that they'll give some rent free and then there'll be some deferment as well so i think they're looking to structure the deals because it is now effectively a debt a lot of tenants for example from a landlord's point of view haven't paid rent for the last 12 months so they've just got to deal with that now as a debt and like we said there's about three and a half billion pounds worth of unpaid rent out there and we always see the landlord as being the rich guys when they haven't received that money then i mean that's not the case anymore and they are very keen to get cash in their in, in their account so i think to um facilitate the deal um and to get some cash in there i think that they're, they're keen to do a deal um rather than sort of take it down the 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 the, the, the lines of going to court or or a uh, or taking legal action yeah no absolutely and and also i guess um you know there are many different types of landlords out there as well you know from institutional to um uh you know sort of small um family funds which presumably makes a difference as well in terms of their resilience yeah, and I, I think that's a good point, Ramati. I mean, I, you know, you've got the you've got the small landlords who've got very big um, tenants, um, and 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 actually the landlords in those circumstances are hurting, and, and tenants that may well have been open throughout uh, throughout the um, pandemic period. So they they are they are hurting more than their tenants are. So so it's 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 a yeah. There are there is a, definitely another side. To this and and the government I think has recognised that it's, it's being lobbied hard by um, by the landlord industry groups as well as as well as the tenant ones mm. um, and I think appreciates that um, the contractually the landlord is owed money um, and needs to receive that money whether that's a combination of of government help or or, or from the tenant um, it needs to it needs to get money that's contractually due to it. So I think I think that there there is definitely the ba that balance in the mind of the of the government, um, which it, um, which I think will um, drive what whatever it does next. And just as there's a call for evidence from tenants, there's also a call for evidence from from landlords as well. And and the government will be lobbied by landlord groups um, as well in relation to their interests. No, absolutely. So I guess we shall have to um, wait wait and see. Um, I would like to just move on to our um, second poll. Um, we've only got two in the session, so this is our second one. Um, you should see the um, question in the view pane um, shortly. Um, so the question is, um, this is just testing the uh, optimism um, of our audience. So how many of our audience have already booked a restaurant for April or May? Um, please vote and click submit. Um, and in the meantime, um, we'll come to the results um, after the next couple of questions, but um, we, we'll move on to the next question for the panel. Um, what changes do you think we'll see to the high street in terms of availability of premises, effect on rents, um, a move out of city centres, which I think we've touched on a little bit before, um, but these sorts of changes are coming about as a result of the pandemic. Um, Richard, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, please. Um, firstly, so our experience as a company has been that there's been significant or increase in demand for the local high street locations, especially in the London towns and villages. Um, this has obviously been driven by lockdown measures and people's new working arrangements, working from home, um, and um, quite simply working and dining in or out locally. Um, you mean the dining out, obviously, between the lockdowns, I mean, sort of visibly was sort of um, was good in the sort of local sort of towns to me um, and then there's the um, the takeouts and deliveries during lockdowns obviously deliveries has sort of skyrocketed um, and a number of cases where we've been speaking to operators they've said that um, as a result of increased delivery in some of their sort of more local stores that they've actually seen increases in turnover to pre-covid levels which is quite remarkable um 
and then in terms of marketing units and, and rent um in on the high street locations we've we've pretty much got to sort of some in some cases in strong locations to pre-covid levels because of the demand um and some cases above albeit they have been fully fitted units so there has been reduced fit out costs in those um so in answer to the question is there availability of the premises yes there has been availability um through a couple of business failures but not so much that it's outstripped demand because there is sufficient demand picking it up albeit we have discussed furlough schemes and lease moratoriums that will be coming to an end sort of later on in the summer and i think the general view is that this is just putting a plaster on things and um when they do finally come to an end there's there's going to be a few more casualties and no doubt more properties come into the market um going forward um i think that you I mean we've touched on this already um i think the long-term view is that companies will be offering a lot more flexibility to employees to work from home maybe two to three days a week um and as a result of that, there is perhaps a more sort of optimistic long-term view for the local high street um, market. Um, and then sort of turning to the, the city centres, I think, again, I mean, Roger mentioned he's not gonna be opening until September, um, that, um, yeah, there is a lot more uncertainty from operators when they're looking at city centres. We haven't had uh, sort of the, the request for, uh, uh, to search for new units within city centres like we have had for the London towns and villages. Um, I mean, the general view is that the return to the office is going to be staggered um, as a result of the new working arrangements. However, I think from speaking to operators, it's hoped and I think anticipated that when people do go into town or into the office in the city, they're going to use that opportunity to have the face to face meetings, the catch up with colleagues. Um, maybe meeting friends and, and clients for breakfast, lunch, and generally go in for that after work beer. So when they are actually in the office, their, their spend is going to be that much greater. So um, I was actually with Canary Wharf Group yesterday, and I know that they've been making lots of preparations um, over lockdown, trying to increase the amount of outdoor social area. Um, they've been speaking to a lot of alternative leisure users, to come onto the estate because they really want the place to be somewhere where you can um, sort of work and, and, and enjoy. So it's, it's to encourage those back into the office and, and sort of say, don't sit at home. It's, it's much more fun being in here, you can socialize. And one of the things that they were um, sort of trying to, were pointing out yesterday was the FOMO effect, which is the, the fear of missing out. So as people come back into the office, there'll be those sitting at home feeling that um, one, maybe their colleagues are getting ahead of them on the the, uh, the, the, the promotion ladder, or two, they, I mean, there's there's sort of yeah, they, they're effectively missing out on that social aspect of it. No, really interesting. Uh, yeah, really interesting point. A um, few smiles and nods there. Um, Adam, um, what's your your sort of take? I think it's actually a really exciting time. Um, we're actively um, looking for sites. Obviously, there's a lot of fully fitted units on the market at the moment. Um, and to be honest, we're probably one of a, probably a few operators out there that are taking full advantage of it. We've, we're starting to see landlords are starting. Now we've got a roadmap and there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. We are seeing some of those negotiations, I wouldn't say dry up, but there's a little bit less flexibility in them as there was three to six months ago. However, I think linking back into the previous kind of uh, remarks, the previous questions, there's landlords are very flexible in some ways, as long as there is a deal to be done on both sides and it has to be equal. I think we're seeing more and more uh, conversations that we're having where as long as you, there is a roadmap within a lease, and whether it be stepped agreements, whether it be ratchets, whether um, some of the incentives, as long as there is a clear line to get back up to where that rent should be over i won't say how many numbers of years i say it's different depending on different properties and locations but we are seeing landlords wanting to do deals and wanting to be very flexible with tenants and work with them but i think even i think we uh, spoke with somebody a couple of days ago and we're seeing a lot of the schemes that have got empty shelves 
they have now realizing that you've got fully fitted units on the market and that's what they're competing with. So there is starting to be a little bit more movement uh, in some of the schemes with uh, shells where we can actually start to see a bit more capital being put offered on the table um, as incentives sort of to get operators in there. So I think it's overall, it's a very exciting time. And for the right operators, it's a very kind of quick step to expand the group. Sorry, that's great and it's really good to hear the optimism. Um, um, Chris? Um, yeah, I think echo the points that are already made. There's always opportunity out there. Um, big worries, I suppose, for our city centres uh, is a big difference when we talk about the high street between a suburban a local village at high streets and you're talking about city centres and high streets. And uh, I'm worried that, you know, the city centres are going to take some time. The other big piece in all of this as well, particularly for places like London, um, are going to be the tourism hit as well. I mean, where that is just, that is huge. It's going to be absolutely huge. And I just, you know, really struggling to see a way through there. Um, so I think you know, there's a number of things at play. Yes, the local high streets where people working from home, people need to get out for an hour. I take that on board. I think the FOMO thing is absolutely bang on, actually. I think, you know, we're seeing that. And the research is telling us now that under 25s want to get back to the office. The over to over 25s are more inclined to want to stay at home, particularly if you've got families and things. Um, obviously, companies are smelling an opportunity to save on 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 salary and costs, and and obviously nobody's going to pay want to pay full rent for an office that's in use for three days a week. So I think a little of things at play. But you've also got planning that needs to be looked at. Is planning fit for purpose now? If we've got to repurpose buildings, if we've got to shrink the amount of available office space, because ultimately that's what we're looking at is. Uh, is less office, uh, a lower requirement for office space, then how can these buildings be repurposed for accommodation? I mean, will city centres become thriving communities in their own right in the next five or 10 years? What's missing is a big vision, is a big plan. I haven't seen anything yet that's come out from government and then they've got to be looking at it. It's, it's having a new vision for these city centres because things have changed. And fundamentally, and this is a lifetime change that's dropping out of a lockdown change. So I think, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm positive in that you know sites will become available uh, ultimately as re also retail continues to go through this accelerated decline increasingly local authorities planners landlords will turn to leisure you know we are that always the default we cannot be our experience cannot be bought at amazon uh, so so ultimately we're going to be required to step in and invest so we're going to need some incentive to do that thank you um, roger Yes, obviously, uh, mirror what's been said. I think um, in the city centres, I think what we might find, particularly in the financial districts or office-based areas, and not just London, I think there's going to be maybe a move away from open plan offices, and this might be a lower density within the office space. I also think the point made earlier about people still being aware of COVID for a long time affects a lot of movement within offices, movement in, in elevators, for example, and, and I think there'll be further restrictions on, on those on the higher buildings, at least for the next 12 months. That, of course, therefore has a knock-on effect with density onto our businesses because there's less people, even though I think the wanting to go back to work, particularly in that, that slightly younger section of the, of the, of the workforce, is, is, is true. Particularly in London, people have very small apartments, often shared with their partner or friend, and you know, who's, who's, who's having the uh, Zoom meeting in the kitchen today and who's using this sort of bedroom. And, and I think I can't wait to... The, the younger workforce can't wait to get back to work because really it is very inconvenient to work from home and and i think i think the, that would probably be more positive than we're saying today i think people will come back to work i just don't think it's till september um and i noticed it i was reading in because in, in, i've got business in in, in in detroit and i noticed in america they're talking about this repurposing offices now taking the over plan away there's a big movement for that a lot of that, a lot a lot out there online about that so i think that might come over here and you might find that every working in these great big environments because of their the fear of, of catching diseases or germs from other people now it's going to be the forefront of our mind for the rest of our lives i think this is going to affect us we're going to think differently i think chris's point earlier as to that so um as for deals i completely agree with adam we've done uh, some really good deals with sensible landlords and we've also with almost all of our um properties found that by talking to the landlords and getting some trust into the conversation has helped. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, a year ago, landlords felt that the uh, tenants perhaps were putting their trousers down and having, and having the, the, and, and overplaying it 
and I think that's an understandable sentiment. However, I think there has been now a meeting in the middle between landlords and tenants, and I think that's completely agree with Adam. That's how we're all able to be doing these fantastic deals. Often ratcheted, and I think you're right, we're, all the deals we're doing eventually get back to something near our current rent rates, but quite a way in the future. I think landlords like that because they can see their long-term value being protected, but they're um, giving the nod to the situation we're in now and helping us restart. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm very optimistic about the future. We've signed six deals all opening um, in May um, because I share Adam's um, optimism and I've been using this year to mine out what I think are the best opportunities for our business. And can I just ask on that, and obviously I appreciate you know, sensitive information, but um, in terms of the new deals, are you looking at different areas that you perhaps wouldn't have gone into a year ago or you would have looked at them differently a year ago? Um, or are they, you know, are you still see um, optimism in the future for city centres you know, or are you looking more at coastal areas or you're around the country? OK, so we've signed deals that we wouldn't have signed before in the cities outside of London, but not. Not the, not the Newcastle and Manchester, so sort of um, upper market um, commuter belt, really, but not just from London. So we're in the southwest now. So we've done, so we have done that. But then I've also taken opportunities in places that I think are cast iron. So Soho, Mayfair, St James's, we've done deals in all those areas because despite where we are, those areas will always, I think, have good demand. So, uh, and in fact, proven my Soho businesses did very well in, in, in lockdown. So, um, I think there's certain areas that will still be okay, even though they are more centralised. Um, I think it, I think I've like wish you repeating myself. I mean, the financial district is the one where there's the biggest question mark. But we might be surprised. This uh, effect of missing out and living in small apartments may have an effect we don't expect, um, and they yeah. may all come. Thank you. Um, and still looking at that sort of crystal ball little as to what's going to happen. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about sort of possible changes to, um, to, to leases, I suppose, and landlord and tenant um, position. Um, what changes to leases do you think we'll see or need to see in the future um, as a result of the difficulties of the past year? I mean, going back to um, shorter term lets, um, more breaks, pre-agreed COVID clauses. Um, Anthony, do you, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think we are going to see, we've seen shorter and shorter leases over the last 20 years. Um, the average lease 20 odd years ago was about, was about 15 years and it's now just over five. So um, it's, we are going to see shorter, shorter leases, I've, I've got no doubt. Um, and traditionally on the high streets, obviously, leases have been, been longer than elsewhere. Um, I think that trend, um, trend towards shorter leases will continue. Um, break options, um, not just having a break option in a lease, but having um, potentially rolling breaks or even sort of breaks at certain periods, I think um, we, will become more prevalent. Um, and that may may suit landlords just as much as, as tenants, in fact, as as the kind of high streets and city centres and and so on evolve. Um, COVID clauses, yeah, it's a it's kind of suspension of rent provisions. That's something that landlords are going to fight against quite hard because I think they're going to have have find it difficult to get insurance in relation to it. So um, I think that is something that landlords will resist and say well why why should we um have the burden of 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 a covid period rather than you the tenant so i think there's going to be some negotiation there uh, potentially with deals being done on the sharing of the pain um perhaps during a during a, a, a lockdown period in the future um i think possible um possibility of forfeiture um, clauses being negotiated slightly differently um, up to now for um, for decades um, forfeiture clauses have been quite wide non-payment of rent um, and, and breach of any other covenants it's, we might see some adapting of, of forfeiture clauses to uh, prevent landlords from forfeiting for certain certain breaches in certain circumstances that's a possibility I think the other the big one probably and this is uh, this is more Richard you than than me. I think probably uh, turnover rents are going to become um, more uh, more prevalent. Um, they obviously there there are some out there, um, not as many as 
um, as, as, as obviously some tenants would like. Um, so I think turnover rents, we're going to see probably more of a certainly pressure from from tenants to um, for, on, on landlords to agree, uh, ag agree those. And I think D Adam made um, made another point sort of straying slightly off leases, but but, um, you know, sort of more more capital investment, uh, more you know, more premises fitted out, probably longer rent free periods in, in, in where where premises are not fitted out to allow tenants to to fit them out and so on. So I think those are the probably the changes we'd like to see. Richard. Thank you. Richard, did you want to yeah add anything? Um yeah, totally agree with what Anthony's saying. We're seeing a lot of tenants sort of pushing for these COVID clauses. Um and like you said, Anthony, and the landlords strongly pushing back on them. I think yeah, the middle ground that's generally being reached if it can um be included is a 50 50 split on um on 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 rent but i think because we would never know what the future lockdown would look like um and what sort of other sort of platforms are available like delivery a lot of landlords are saying look we've we've, we've given concessions or we've held our tenants out in the current situation depending on the individual tenant situation and how they've been able to trade will deal with it as and when they don't like having them in there because it affects the investment value of their of their asset um, but yeah i think market forces will sort of um, prevail in that and depending on how much demand there is for the unit and those operators who will take a view that they'll they'll, they'll go without um, and again yeah so the turnover yeah it's a sort of a base and turnover so bringing uh, introducing the base rent because i think the landlords always like to have an element of base rent to sort of maintain an element of capital value with a turnover top up and again you see it across all schemes um landlord big land landlord schemes but um again it's going to be market forces and um that that dictate whether you mean There'll be a number of operators who will go forward with a base and turnover provision, but you'll always get an operator then who will come forward and say, "Look, I'll, I'll knock everybody out of the water with a, a straight rental deal." And yeah, and I know which one the landlord goes for, <laughs> ten times out of ten. <laughs> no, fair enough. Thank you. Um, I am conscious of time, and I know that there are um, a couple of interesting points which I think it'd be useful to touch on. Um, touch on just before we end. Um, if we could maybe go to the results of the um, second poll then, um, which is how many of our audience have already booked a restaurant um, for April or May? Um, interesting, actually. 38% um, have said yes, um, they have, and 62% um, have said no, not yet. Um, I, I kind of thought um, that it might be um, more people actually having booked. I don't know. Does this accord um, with, with the with the panel's experience in terms of booking so far, um, uh, Adam? Um, is this accord with your experience so far? Um, I think this probably is a reflection of obviously um, all the, the, the attendees we have, because I think a lot of the operators, I know people I've been speaking with. They've just said their fo their focus is getting up, operating. They're not going out for a while. They know it's going to be a tough few months, um, and then they'll probably go for a drink or uh, grab a quick bite to, bite to eat. But it'll be um, it won't be a pre-planned. But I think we are seeing a bit of a mix in the industry with people wanting deposit like deposits for to secure bookings. There's there's other barriers and factors in there, especially especially for the opening in April. I think there's there's very few people that will be booking this far in advance um, with the, the wonderful weather we seem to have, um, <laughs> the unpredictable weather. Uh, there's lots of factors in there, but we are we are seeing a nice steady increase of bookings from um, the 17th of May, which is which is very very good to see. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to raise a couple of other questions, and by all means, um, if the panel sort of wanted to to add in any other comments, because I think we're in our, our last few minutes. Um, vaccination passports, um, this has been um, you know, on the news um, just this week, and actually we were talking about it um, just before the session started. Um, uh, Chris, I would like to pass this over to you. Um, do you have any views on um, vaccination passports and um, pract <laughs> practical workable uh, leading uh, question? I just depressing, isn't it? Yet another invidious position that we've been dumped in by the government, you know, and it's just a, 
you know, we can't make a policy decision on this, and we can't force it, so we'll just, uh, it, uh, put, you know, we'll dump it on trade to police it for them, uh, almost, as it feels like the way it's going. I mean, we just keep, uh, sort of, uh, it's bugged me, I think, for the last 48 hours, that, you know, every time uh, anything happens, a uh, pub suddenly comes to the fore as, the, as a way of rationalising, a way of delivering something, or a way of actually uh, finding a scapegoat or somebody to blame, you know, and... Uh, of course, now this is being dumped on our shoulders. Look, I mean, anybody who's operating out there knows it's hard enough to get people to put a face mask on to go to the toilet, particularly as the government require it. The COVID marshals, the local authority, the police walking around the businesses expect you to, to enforce it. And yet you can't. You can't. You can't. You mean, and because you meet it into the realms of disability discrimination, if you do, and uh, people aren't obliged to tell you why they, they can't wear a mask, they just don't have to. And if you can buy a lanyard on eBay for a pound to put around your neck, you, you've got nowhere to go. And yet it needs yet another silly uh, uh ill thought through media grabbing uh point that that's been made and it's just not going to go anywhere it's not going to be workable but it, it does beg a question question again about hospitality and i suppose being a, a publican um you know particularly our sector is that why aren't they talking about vaccine passports for gyms why aren't we talking about vaccine passports for cinemas why aren't we talking about vaccine passports for non-essential retail i mean we saw you know we were two and three percent of the overall infections from the public health's own figures in the auto last year, retail was 18 to 20 percent. So, so you know, if you want to go into a non-essential retailer, why not ask for a vaccine passport at the door? It's a higher risk environment according to the government's own numbers. So, yeah, it gets my blood boiling. I'm afraid it's unworkable. It's impractical. Uh, there's going to be a huge amount of legal cases flying around about discrimination. And um, yeah, yet again, you know, here we are being whipped. Prior to this question, all we've talked about is leisure probably coming in and saving the high street, saving the economy, to go be in the generator of jobs and investment. And you get, we get this landed on us. It just never makes any sense to me. I, I find it depressing and annoying. <laughs> Fair enough. And um, just um, on a slightly different tack, um, what can um, what can central and or local government do to help longer term in a practical sense? So obviously we had the budget recently. I know that there was a lot of disappointment um, about the delayed rates review, um, you know, queries about VAT. Um, th there are all sorts of other things, I suppose, at local government level um, in terms of relaxation of restrictions on external space. I think um, we touched on earlier um, planning um, and the whole planning regime. Um, Roger, I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on um, you know, what you'd like to see um, the, the government doing at um, you know, central government or local government doing just to just to help going forward and, and, and make um, the situation better for um, leisure operators across the board. Well, I think, again, it depends on where you are. One of the things that's concerning me, particularly in London, is the jerk reaction to uh, public protection has caused traffic jams when we've got no traffic. So a lot of, let alone what's going to happen in city centres. Uh, in the southwest, Bath has now brought in a conge uh, the um, uh, the air quality zone that's affecting businesses there. For example, it's the first of the new um, controlled air zones, and uh, it's gonna, which are going to be all over the country. And whilst these are very important, they are give people yet more opportunities for reasons not to go to to the to the centres and I think there needs to be a slightly more joined approach. Um, you know, public safety, cycling, of course, it's it's at the forefront of everybody, um, and, and people want want these amenities, but they're affecting everything from deliveries to uh, pe 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 moving moving traffic around, circulation, and and, and sort of clogging everything up. And I think these are factors that haven't got a joined up enough approach. So I think I think city centre planners need to be thinking not just in what is trendy to think about. And sounds good, but perhaps really what the actual true knock-on effects of what they're doing are, although they might seem to make people to be a good idea, they're not a good idea. Believe me, they're clogging up the cities and causing less opportunities to come out. No, thank you. Um, I am so sorry because we have a number of other questions um, around the effect of um, Brexit. Will the nightclub experience ever be the same again? Um, but we um, have pretty much um, run out of time. Um, uh, if your questions weren't answered, um, our team will follow up with you individually. Um, but I think as we hit 10.15, um, um, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our panel. Um, you've been fantastic. Um, and to thank you, everyone, for joining today's session. 
Um, we hope you found it useful. Um, our sessions are recorded and can be found on the Field Fisher YouTube channel post-event. Um, and if you'd like to discuss this topic further, please do get in touch with us. Um, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good luck, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care.